Welcome to the Political Science Club Student Mock Presidential Debate. Today we have with us Scott Good as Rocky Anderson, Matthew Hissey as Ron Paul, Alex Ramo as Mitt Romney, Jackson Smith as Dr. Gingrich, and Ken Regal as Obama. The first question that I have for you is that many citizens are increasingly concerned about the rising U.S. deficit. Noting these concerns and recent troubles in the Eurozones, what plans, if any, do you have to reduce the U.S. debt? Well, uh, tax cuts and austerity measures do not help at all. Uh, we need to continue to invest and, uh, and stop the cut defense budget by 50% because we are waging illegal wars and, and, and uh, Religion, illegal wars, and funding dictators all over the world, and all of that uh, detracts from our budget and uh, and our and culminates our debt more than anything else. And we need to cut defense budget by a significant margin. We need to end these illegal wars, which I have adamantly been against since the very beginning as mayor of Salt Lake City. I even uh, advocated for the impeachment of President Bush as mayor. And that's my solution. Thank you very much. Dr. Paul? All right. Um, the U.S. deficit is a, it's a huge problem that uh, many people are just starting to realize now. Um, my plan to restore America cuts $1 trillion and that's a trillion of real spending, not future spending, but real spending, both domestic and foreign. Um, and what we can do with that is we can bring American capital, American equity back to the United States. And you know, everyone says, well, we have such a partisan Congress. How are you going to get that through? How are you going to pass these laws? They can't even pass a budget. Um, and my response would be, it's all about building coalitions um, you know, that are all bounded in liberty. Uh, we don't, Democrats and Republicans both are spending trillions of dollars overseas that we don't need. Obama signed the NDNA Act on January 1st that now puts U.S. They can put U.S. citizens in prison without trial by the military. Uh, he's also assassinating U.S. citizens. So George Bush wasted trillions of dollars in starting the wars. Obama's wasted trillions of dollars in, um, in continuing the wars. And I want to cut the military-industrial complex because that is where the spending is. But with that being said, you're not cutting one penny from our national defense because that is the most important responsibility of the federal government under our Constitution. Thank you very much. Mitt Romney. It's as simple as making a smaller, smarter government. We need to reduce taxes, spending, regulation, and we need to cut government programs. Under the first 43 presidents, we had a debt of $6.3 trillion. Under Obama, in three years, we have a debt of He's increased our debt by $6.5 trillion on stuff we don't need. We need to repeal Obamacare. It's as simple as that, and repealing the AMT, the Alternative Minimum Tax. Day one of my administration, I will send a bill to Congress that cuts non-security disgruntled spending by 5% across the board. Thank you very much. Dr. Gingrich? <clears throat> well, Restoring America's future is very simple. The first thing we need to do is we need to stop the 2013 tax increase. In 2010, in uh, December, Congress voted to increase the Bush tax cuts, and for the past two years, we have experienced job creation. We need to make these tax cuts permanent so that we can make our job creation last. The second thing we need to do is we need to increase the, uh, <clears throat> we need to encourage business to come back to America. Currently, our ta corporate taxes are some of the highest in the world, which is why if elected president, I will uh, demand a 12.5% corporate tax rate. And in order to promote small business, which uh, employs roughly 60% of the American populace, I will encourage government funding of new enterprise. <clears throat> we also need to reform taxes because Billions of dollars are wasted every year on the IRS. How can we do this, you ask? Very simple. We can move towards an optional 15% flat tax. And we can also strengthen the U.S. dollar. One of the major problems facing America today, and uh, one of the major 
criticisms of the uh, U.S. economy is how weak the dollar has become. So we must strengthen the dollar by returning to Reagan-style monetary policies that stopped runaway inflation and <clears throat> uh, reforming the Federal Reserve to make it more transparent. Thank you very much. President Obama. When the economy crashed in 2008, it struck most Americans by the eye, right in the middle of the eyes, I should say. Ever since then, I have implemented policies that have slowly helped the economy get back to not pre pre-Bush era, but even before that when the economy was striving. Thanks to the American Jobs Act and the stimulus bill, we have put numerous, almost millions of Americans back to work. And we are, every day the econo economy is growing larger and larger. While the deficit was surmountable from the previous administration, we are still working to get it back under control by ending the war in Iraq and slowly withdrawing our troops from the war in Afghanistan. Obama. Thank you very much. Now we shall have one minute, one minute for retorts or response to anything that's been said. Uh, originally, I was going to begin from uh, my right to left. I figured that actually since you guys going to speak, Mr. President, we should begin from the opposite end again. And so, Rocky Anderson, you have one minute. Uh, another thing we have to do in order to control the debt is to eliminate the influence, influence of corporations, big business, big business, and large banks. Obama's stimulus bill may have helped somewhat in his uh, way he bailed out the bank, big banks, which didn't, wasn't necessary. We need to break up the big banks and create smaller ones to make it more efficient, and then that will help fix the economy to an extent. Thank you very much. Just a few things with all these candidates. Um, I mean, everyone's talking about all these different things. Um, so to start out with, um, Mitt Romney, um, you know, you talk about stabilizing the dollar, you talk about bringing costs down. You left Massachusetts, you were the grant, you decided, you created Obamacare, and now Massachusetts currently has the highest um, health care cost in the United States of America. Um, so that's what's going on there. And then when it comes to Newt Gingrich, um, you want to extend the Bush tax cuts, um, there should be no income tax at all. We should repeal the uh, income tax amendment because people's work is the fruit of their labor and our Constitution entitles us to keep our own property. So why are people going to continue to work if the government's going to be taking their, what they're producing, the fruits of their labor? Um, and, uh, and that's just unethical. We should be able to keep what we earn. Um, and when it comes down to the dollar, you want to go back to Reagan era economics. Reagan wasn't on the gold standard, and also Reagan got us into billions and trillions of dollars of debt by, or sorry, billions of dollars of debt, by building up a military to try to offset the Soviet Union. We had no business doing that. We had business focusing on reforming our country and putting that money back into the United States. Thank you very much, Dr. Paul. Mitt Romney? As I've said before, and I'll say it again, we need to cut Obamacare. We need to create a smaller government that is smart and all of it. We need, we, need to, we need to stop spending money. It's as simple as that. We have too much money invested in programs that we don't need, cabinet positions, departments, you name it. We need to make it smaller. Thank you very much, Dr. Gingrich. All right. First of all, you shall not take the good name of Ronald Reagan in vain. Now, <clears throat> we've discussed uh, lowering taxes and cutting spending. What if we balance the budget? During my tenure as Speaker of the House, we passed a balanced budget for the first time in more than a generation. And another way that we can save money and make America the greatest country to live in uh, once again is by repealing Obamacare, which many of you support and I believe is a fantastic idea. Thank you very much, Mr. President. Uh, yes, uh, Representative Gingrich, I believe you were censured by the Congress during that time as well, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, but anyway, I believe that Obamacare is actually, it's providing millions of Americans with insurance that otherwise would almost be, you know, pardon the expression, up the creek without a paddle. You know, the government, you know, doesn't have to provide every American with complete health care, but just because you are born and are in a bad economic circumstance doesn't mean that you should have the cancer in your body waste away at you until you, there's absolutely nothing left of your body and your soul. And that you know, we are working hard in the government to make sure that you know the economy is growing and strong as always. Real quick, since you called me out about uh, the Reagan thing, uh, Reagan, uh, I have anybody on the stage. Uh, Reagan actually endorsed me in 1981, saying I was the only guy who talks about the Constitution. 
uh, in the correct way. So I just want to point that out. Thank you. Uh, we'll maintain the topic on the economy for now. So concerning the rather controversial realm of tax reform and consistent claims of class warfare resulting from proposals on both sides, what constitutes class warfare? And how could reforms be enacted without engaging in such behavior? We'll begin this time with Mr. President. During the course of my administration, we have made several efforts com to combat what we see and interpret as an attempt at causing class warfare within the United States. The actual definition of class warfare is hard to pin down. In my eyes, not asking every American to do his or her fair share in terms of tax, rate, tax rates and deficit reduction is the best definition of it. The rejection of the recent buffer rule in the Congress is just one of the many steps taken which I and several other of my colleagues in the Democratic Party see as steps towards class warfare. To re enact reforms and taxation changes takes a lot of negotiating, hard work, and patience on both sides of the aisle. We have the abilities to fix the problems, but more often than not, we let politics get in the way of our long-term goals. Thank you very much. Dr. Gingrich? <coughs> Uh, yes, you're, you're more than welcome, uh, speakers, to ask to ask the question again. Concerning class warfare, what constitutes class warfare, and how can reforms be enacted to avoid such attacks? Well, I believe that the uh, simplest and most direct way to uh, avoid class warfare and other uh, uh, social ills that distract us from the real issues at hand facing our country is to institute a flat tax. If we were to simply tax every American at 15%, no one would be unfairly burdened. We would not be uh, stifling the economic productivity of our nation's wealthy. And 15% is not too much to ask from middle America. And it is, in fact, a lower tax rate than they currently pay. Thank you very much. Mitt Romney, you have the floor. When it comes to class warfare, I don't think it exists in America. When you look at it, everybody pays their fair share of taxes. And if increasing the buffer rule, that just puts a burden on the job creators who have the money to fuel the economy. By reducing taxes, it will allow the job creators to have more money to put into the economy and build a better, build a better economy. Thank you very much. I would say that I'm the only candidate on the stage who actually really cares about what the class war is and how it's affecting this country right now. You see the Occupy Wall Street people, you see the Tea Party people, people are pissed off at what's happening in the world right now. And that's because of a simple thing called the Federal Reserve Banking System. It's a private bank, it's unaccountable to nobody at all whatsoever, and they're, they have the ability to print money out of thin air. They have trillions now going to overseas, to overseas banks to prop them up. Now we're the reserve currency of the world, and when we run out of money, the Fed just prints more and prints more, and it devalues our currency. And how does that affect you? Well. What happens to your grandma who gets $1,000 a month? $1,000 a month from her Medicare and Social Security. Well, when you have inflation, inflation because of the Federal Reserve's creation of money, the gallon of milk she buys every week, instead of being a dollar, it's now $2. It's it, When you're looking at groceries, gas, look at your gas prices now, they're $4 a gallon. What would you be spending that other money on right now if it wasn't $4 a gallon? It should be a dime, a, a silver dime, as Ron Paul said in the debate. Um, but again, the point is that the Federal Reserve creates an artificial level of where our currency stands. It inflates our savings, it inflates our hard earnings, and it takes the most de it has the most devastating impact on the underprivileged, underprivileged and inner city people because they're the ones who have the less income to spend, yet food and gas are necessities to live. So by inflating our currency, these people are the most disadvantaged in the country. Thank you very much. Rocky Anderson, go. Uh, I agree with Representative Paul here. There's little I, I disagree with from the Occupy movement, and I'm sure that there's little that, that they would disagree with in my views. We do need to add to the Fed. They have dramatically changed the economy for the worse. And to Representative to Romney and uh, Ginrich here, the flat tax, what's a flat tax to a poor person? Is this the same to a rich person? The rich person pays 15%. Well, 15% of $1 million is a heck of a lot different from 15% from $20,000. We need to institute a progressive tax system that, that builds up as it goes up, up to the top. So the top pays more in taxes that would fund, better fund the government. Thank you very much. 
Mr. President, you have a minute for response or report to anything that's been said thus far. I would uh, like to say that I fervently disagree with a flat tax, I believe. A flat tax does not help anybody in this country. It really just, you know, 15% 15 of $35 is a lot different than 15% of $100. So I do not believe that a flat, flat tax is the way to go for the United States. Thank you very much. Dr. Gingrich? Well, uh, like some of my colleagues, I also believe in uh, reforming the Federal Reserve. However, I do believe that it is still an integral part of the United States uh, monetary policy, which is why uh, it simply needs to be reformed and transparency needs to be increased. Now, as far as a flat tax goes, uh, your points about uh, the uh, disproportionate impact on the disadvantage is extremely well taken, which is why I advocate an optional flat tax. So individuals who do not want to participate in the system may uh, stay where they are under the current tax uh, bracket that they fall within. And <clears throat> those who want to participate in a 15% flat tax may do so. And <clears throat> as far as um, increasing the efficacy of things such as Medicare and Medicaid, which Dr. Paul mentioned, I uh, fervently support modernizing the Food and Drug Administration. Thank you very much, Dr. Gingrich. Mitt Romney? There's one thing that's not going to work. It's raising ta taxes on the rich. Absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> Anybody. <laughs> President Obama wants to raise our taxes, but what he doesn't understand is that it'll prevent us from wanting to spend our money and stimulate the economy. He thinks that by raising the taxes, that money generated will go into the economy and stimulate it. It's not going to work like that. We need to reduce the taxes on the rich so they have more money to spend and put into the economy. Thank you very much, Dr. Paul. The whole idea of taxes and people paying taxes and people having to spend 50% of their income or 10% or not pay anything at all, it's all a manifestation of the growth of government that we have to pay for now. The, the United States has had an appetite for big government since the early 20th century. You know, we've, we've grown several different federal departments exponentially, and how much better are we today? We're not, we're not that much better. And so we go back to the issue of taxes. Prior to the 20th century, we didn't have an income tax. The government can fund itself and not have to worry about funding an empire on just the constitutional taxes that were written by our founding fathers, which is excise taxes, among others, which are resulted from economic uh, ch choice to participate in an economic transaction. Those are where those taxes are derived from. That way, if you make 20000 a year or $100 million a year, it doesn't really matter. That's the money that you earned. But the more people, the more money that we put into people's pockets, the more that they're going to feel a sense of security and be able to live a more prosperous life. So if our goal is to enhance the standard of living to our citizens, then we need to get rid of the income tax altogether and allow the free market to work. Thank you very much. And Rocky Anderson, you have the last word on this question. Well, back to the question, class warfare does exist. Just follow the money from all the presidential candidates up here and where they get the money from. It's all from big corporations and <laughs> all the big corporations and big business and banks and and the super rich of the one percent. Which when you get that out of the system, things start to change. Things will go for the better. That's why we need to do a progressive tax system that will better better help the rich being able to help uh, pay for the, the needs of the poor. Thank you very much. Now moving on to the realm of foreign affairs, as many of you may recall, within the last couple of months there was much brouhaha over Palestine's application for recognition by the United Nations. So in keeping with that, there's a two-state solution as proposed by the Roadmap for Peace under President Bush, uh, the real solution for the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. And we shall begin with Rodney Anderson. Uh, yes, the conflict between Israel and Palestine can be achieved through a two-state solution. It is very easy, and the whole entire world actually recognizes that. That's why almost the entire world advocated for Palestine to have their own country. But the United States vetoed it the UN Security Council. They have done this numerous times. The U.S. is U.S. Should, be, should treat Israel just like every other ally that they have. And when Israel violates human rights abuses and 
builds on the Gaza Strip, they should be punished, not given $3 million a year. And that would go a long way to building support within the Muslim world if the United States actually treats Israel like everybody else. Thank you very much, Dr. Paul. Uh, I mean, I think it's simple for me. I think we should mind our own business. I don't think we should be telling Israel how to run their country. I like to think of Israel as, as a small child. We helped create it. We helped, we helped give them independence after the slaughter of their people, and um, which was, it was celebrated across the world. We were helping these people. Um, you know, and then we kind of took care of them, helped them grow up, helped them modernize. Some say we helped give them nuclear weapons. I'm not really sure. But the point is we helped them grow up. They're growing up now. They're, they're over 50 years old, if not more. And they have said, in a, Netanyahu said to the United States Congress that let Israel defend itself. Let Israel take care of itself. If they want to attack Iran, let them attack, our, uh, attack Iran. It's not our business. All these resources that we're wasting overseas, well, why don't we use that to pay for the, the underclass of society? Why don't we use that to help get people health care? Why don't we use that spending to help make our society more equal and prosperous for everybody? If it's really about fairness and equality, then why are we wasting our money building bridges and giving them bombs and giving them money when we have kids who are starving, we have kids who don't have health care, and kids who don't get their education. And that should be the priority of my, that will be the priority of my administration, not dealing with Israel or other overseas countries. Thank you very much. On the question of whether we should have a two-state system, the answer is no. We need to work with Israel. They're our friends, they're our allies. We need to take away any assistance to Palestine as long as they push a government on the UN that has Hamas and leadership. We need to be a fair weather friend for Israel. Support them in the good, and we shouldn't support them in the bad. Thank you very much. Dr. Nancy. Well, as far as the two-state solution is concerned, we are missing the broader point here. America needs sound foreign policy, and we must understand that our enemies tell the truth and tell the truth about them. We are engaged in a long-term war against radical Islam. <clears throat> it is a belief system that is here too by a small minority of Muslims, but nonetheless powerful and organized ideology within Islamic thought that is totally incompatible with the modern world. We must think big as a country. America currently lacks unified grand strategy for defeating radical Islam. <clears throat> the result of that, we currently view Iraq and Afghanistan and many other danger spots around the globe as if they're isolated and independent situations. Only a grand strategy for marginalizing, <clears throat> isolating, and defeating radical Islamists across the world will lead to victory. We must know our values. American foreign policy must begin by understanding of, uh, who we are as a country. <clears throat> we are, as Ronald Reagan said, the world's abiding alternative to tyranny. Therefore, America's foreign policy must be to ensure our own survival and protect those with whom we share our values. And this is why we must never turn our back on our closest friend and allies, Israel. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. President. For decades, there has been a stalemate. Two peoples with a legitimate aspiration, each with a painful history that makes compromise elusive. It is easy to point fingers for Palestinians to point out displacement brought by Israel's founding and for Israelis to point to the constant hostility and attacks through the history from within its borders as well as beyond. But if we see this conflict only from one side or another, then we will see, then we will be blind to the truth. The only resolution for the aspirations of both sides to be met through is to be met through two states where Israelis and Palestinians each live in peace and security. Thank you very much. Now that wonderful time we'll look forward to, the one minute for response and recording what has thus far been said. Rocky Anderson, you go first. Uh, yes, what, going what President Obama said, we do see this conflict through one side, Israel's side. Israel, as Gingrich said, is our steadfast ally. We give them $3 million a year, nuclear weapons, all sorts of different uh, things that we don't give anybody else. This is all because of the influence of APAC and the Israeli lobby and other corporations that benefit from all of this. We need to acknowledge that both sides, Palestine and Israel, have committed human rights abuses, and we need to go about it in a very neutral way. Thank you very much. Dr. Paul. Uh, the way we need to look at foreign policy, again, is money or business. Um, but while money our own business, we need to set the example of, of a great nation. By promoting free markets and individual freedom and individual liberty and empowering our citizens 
to to get involved, to produce, to to try to make money, to try to make a better life for themselves. That's what this country is about. That's what made us great, and that's what this this country needs to return to. We're, we're not a country that all shares the same ideology. We're a country of individuals, all of whom are different. We all look at look and think about things differently, um, and so we just need to try to build the best possible country we have by freeing people up to get involved in the market, to start businesses, to help their neighbors, to do whatever they might want to do, and. That is the way that we set the example. People will look at us and say, wow, look at the United States. They make sense. That's how we became the world superpower after World War I. People saw us and they looked to us for greatness because we were the only ones left in the world because everyone was broke to support their debt, to help give them loans, to help rebuild Europe after World War I and World War II. And now we're the policemen of the world and we should mind our own business. Thank you very much. Mitt Romney. The one thing we need to do is we need to work to prevent the push to get rid of Israel. It's simple. They're our ally. We give them money, we give them weapons. We need they, the two the two state system will not work. And as I said before, we need to stop giving assistance and money to any Hamas driven Palestine government. Thank you very much. Dr. Gay. Now, Dr. Paul, it is interesting that you should mention World War One because that was a point in American history when we were promoting isolationist foreign policy. And look how well it worked for us. We ended up in two world wars within a 20 year period. Now, <clears throat> what we must do is we must remain the greatest nation on earth for our defense. And we can do this by securing our borders to prevent terrorists from, and uh, terrorist organizations from sneaking agents and weapons into the United States. We can also incentivize math and science education and <clears throat> America to ensure that uh, our men and women of the armed forces always have the uh, most advanced and powerful weapon systems at the in the world at their disposal. This is how we can make America safe. Thank you very much. I'm suppressing a last word on this question. In 2011, I gave a speech calling for Israel to return to the 1967 borders. Before the 1967 war, Israel was still in its infancy, and there was rel even though numerous Arab countries were ready to attack Israel, it defended itself successfully. And ever since then, the violence in that region, and especially in Israel and the Palestinian conflict, has only grown exponentially. And I still stand behind my, my call for Israel to return to the 1967 borders. All right. Thank you very much. Um, we shall have one more question as presented, and then we, think we shall open up the floor for any questions. And if there are none, we'll return uh, to the planned questions. So for the meanwhile, though, much has been said regarding the lessons learned from Vietnam. What do you see, if any, as being the lessons from Iraq and Afghanistan thus far? Mr. President, you have the first word. The Iraq and Afghanistan wars were fought bravely by our servicemen for almost a decade each. While we were able to accomplish several key military goals, we did, however, learn a lot of lessons in the process. One of them is the extreme might of our armed forces will not always guarantee political power. While we managed to dethrone Saddam Hussein in under a month, the uncertainty and the influence of Iran played a much larger role than any Iraqi army. Also, we must look long term in our military <coughs> ventures. The previous administration did not seem to have a grasp of the tense situation in Iraq beforehand. Because of this, Iran is breathing down the neck of Iraq in an even bigger threat than it was before. Also, the intelligence questions that we seek to answer must be fulfilled 100% before we can take the risk of involving ourselves in another battle and occupation such as Afghanistan and Iraq. Thank you very much. The lessons to be learned from the wars in Afga uh, Iraq and Afghanistan are quite simple, really. <clears throat> Military force must be used judiciously within a clear, obtainable objective, and understand, uh, this must be understood by Congress. These vague uh, objectives and uh, long-term conflicts that we've uh, embroiled ourselves in are simply not, the, they're, they're simply not uh, things we should be getting involved in. Our military actions must have concise, definable goals and during my tenure as Speaker of the House, 
I saw, oversaw the passage of legislation that enhanced the freedom of both our uh, intelligence gathering agencies and our armed forces so that we could uh, be prepared for such events. And my work as uh, Speaker of the House was commended by the Bipartisan 9-11 Commission. Thank you very much. Mitt Romney. All right, we've gotten the job done, and the president has pulled the troops. But now that he's pulled the troops, we need to finish the job with diplomacy. Used by using diplomacy in Iraq and Afghanistan, we'll be able to create exactly what we want there for, to create a stabilized center and an American-friendly region. By, um, by using diplomacy and not arms, we should be able to repair America's image as well. Thank you very much. Dr. Paul. I just want to notate that I'm the only one on the stage who actually has served in the U.S. Armed Forces. I'm the only veteran on the stage. Uh, and I knew that when you got drafted, you dodged it. And uh, you know, when I got drafted, I had a family and I went because that's what you do when your country needs you. And uh, that's why I want to be president because my country needs me right now. Um, uh, but when we look to Iraq and we look to the different wars we've had, we have to look at the idea of what government should do. And that is when, that's the military also. The government should be able to do something that I can't do. So if I can't go and steal your property and build, build a house, then the government should be able to do that. Um, the government uses compulsory force to get what they want, uh, to kind of do what they want to do. And, um, and that happens in Iraq. We go over there, we invade a country, and we, we, we kind of we occupy it. We, create it. we have created an empire that, that expands around the, entire United, around the entire globe. And what have we learned historically about empires? They don't work. Look at the Soviet Union. They built up and they built up, uh, and they, they got in the arms race with, with the United States. And look what happened. Their economy and their infrastructure deteriorated so badly that they collapsed because they had no more money left. They coll collapsed into, and broke apart. The USSR no longer existed, and that was almost overnight. Um, and uh, there's several other examples of empires. The Roman Empire. Um, whenever, whenever empires try to extend themselves or overreach, they always fail. So if the Soviet Union couldn't win Afghanistan, and they were one of the world's superpowers, why can the United States win Afghanistan? Over 70% of the population supports bringing the troops home there. Before I put troops, if, when I'm president, before I put troops into harm's way, I would think about what I want to do. Would I do that? You know, if I, is it worth our troops dying for? And being the only one up here who's actually been in battle, I'm the one who I'm the only one who's actually capable of making that unbiased call. Um, and so we don't. We need to double check intelligence. Iran, the CIA says there's no evidence at all about nuclear weapons. Look at Iraq though. There was yellow cake uranium in Iraq. Um, there was weapons of mass destruction, there was chemical weapons. We go in there, we overthrow it, and nothing. I mean, that's what the policy is these days. Thank you very much, Dr. Paul. I'm Rocky Anderson. One of the lessons we can certainly learn from both Vietnam and Iraq is to look forward to what most of the cans up here, except for myself and Ron Paul, advocate for a war like with Iran. Another illegal war that the United States Empire wants for, for oil and big corporations. But another uh, lesson I see is the huge growth in American government and the civil liberties abuses by the American government. The warrantless wiretapping, the, the targeting and killing of American citizens. None of this would, has happened, but none of this would have happened without the American government growing significantly after 9-11. And, uh, and without the and then this government needs to go back to the War Powers Resolution in 1973 and the law that they created that and de decreased the military's involvement around the world. And if we stop giving money to dictators and supporting dictators around the world, America would become a much better place and less full of enemies around us. Thank you very much. Time for the one minute retort. So beginning again with you, Mr. President. I'd like to add that in the 10 years that we have been fighting in Afghanistan, I believe that this war has strengthened the national security of our country between the objectives in toppling the Taliban and, strength and weakening al-Qaeda. I believe that this war it was necessary to ensure the security of our country along with the efforts to find and kill Osama bin Laden, which finished last year. Thank you very much. Dr. Gingrich. <coughs> As the son of a uh, career soldier, I have always uh, felt a deep sense of duty to protect my country and to do what's best for it, which is why I've served as a distinguished uh, honorary professor at the Air University, T 
teaching major generals on uh, <clears throat> joint military defense. Thank you very much. Mitt Romney? And it comes down to it, it all comes down to diplomacy. We need to use our diplomats to work out plans so we won't have to do deal with Iran like we did uh, with Iraq and Afghanistan. Thank you very much, Dr. Paul. So, so real quick, so you were an esteemed scholar and that's why you got to draft, or, uh, never mind, sorry. But yeah, uh, basically, well, look at Al-Qaeda. That was the goal of invading Afghanistan, right? To get rid of Al-Qaeda that attacked us on 9-11. They weren't in Iraq when we attacked Afghanistan, but now Al-Qaeda is in Iraq. Now they are attacking our troops in Iraq. And that is because of the U.S. presence there. We, we occupy a land that pisses people off. People don't like U.S. troops, military troops around them in their marketplaces. Bombs going up all the time as a result of the U.S. being there. So Al-Qaeda, it, it, it breeds there. People get are really, really frustrated, so more people get involved. So Al-Qaeda wasn't there before, it's there now. And it comes down to that the United States Congress needs to declare their wars. The US, we elect representatives to do what we would like them to do. And so what they need to do is declare wars, because that's what the Constitution says they can do. A, 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 an executive branch of government has no authority under the US Constitution to unilaterally go and invade a different country or bomb another country or do any of that. Because killing people is wrong, and that's why you need more than one person making that decision. Thank you very much. Rocky Anderson, you last comment. Well, this goes back with uh, Iraq, Iran. We, we still are advocating to go to war for no reason whatsoever. There's no evidence of nuclear weapons in either country. Iran is pursuing a nuclear nuclear capacity, yes, and they have every reason to go for a nuclear weapon with all the enemies around them. And America try going for war. Thank you very much. At this point, we'll open the floor up to questions. I will ask Dr. Clyburn to please choose ones. But with this understanding, you may address a question to an individual, but make it, try to work in such a way that anyone can pick up the question and answer and discuss it so we can continue. Um, so with that said, 